<laughs> Yo, what is up, knights? Aegis Rick here, and this is part two of the Masters of the Otherverse series, where we cover in depth how to clear every room of every dungeon in the Otherverse. This time, we're going to be taking a look at Castle Nebulous, which is considered one of the most gimmicky of all the Otherverse dungeons. Be mindful of all of the gimmicks in this dungeon, and be sure to look at the ones with cube warnings, as you can ruin the run for the entire party otherwise. But without further ado, let's talk about Castle Nebulous. Man, that's cool to say! As previously mentioned, Castle Nebulous isn't the type of dungeon that necessarily tests your character's strength, it mostly tests the player's patience. In terms of what you need to pack before going in here, there are two pretty devastating debuffs you probably need to take care of. I've listed them in order of importance, but bring them all. The Stone Recovery Potion is necessary for the final boss battle, which casts his ultimate skill which can stone you for upwards of 40 seconds and is incredibly hard to dodge if not skip. The Expert Brainwash Potion is for an attack that the mini boss casts which can nullify all of your controls. The Sky Tree Nut is not necessary, but it might be helpful for some of the rooms in here. And as always, I will always suggest to bring the provisional HP and MP pots as you see necessary. But anyway guys, that's about it. Let's go. Room 1 and we're already fighting a mini boss? Well, kinda. See, this guy and all of his cronies aren't invincible. What? That is, until he makes himself vulnerable. This window of opportunity only presents itself whenever he performs his only attack, a long-range x-axis grab. Any players caught in range of the attack will be grabbed and held in place for a significant amount of time. During this time, his blue summons will make themselves vulnerable to attack, as they attempt to hit those who are grabbed. It is then up to those who are not grabbed to kill all of the minions during this time. You cannot damage the miniboss itself, but instead he takes a fixed amount of damage every time he is forced to resummon more minions. This means you'll need to do this many times in order to kill him. Seems easy enough. Well, almost. See, whenever a player is grabbed, they are inflicted with a debuff that primes them. The primer can be indicated by this skull icon down here, or the black dot streaming across your character. If this character is grabbed again during the duration of the debuff, they will be instantly killed. The strategy then is to either cure the debuff or simply wait the small duration of time for it to wear off. It is because of this that the general strategy is to cycle through your various party members and allow everyone a chance to get grabbed so that the mini boss doesn't grab the same person twice in succession. It should be noted that these dungeons are designed with level 70 characters in mind, so if you're higher level than that, there is a small chance that the debuff will not be applied to you at all, which is convenient. Weak APCs and summons such as turrets can be grab targets for the mini boss, but just know that for the next room, you are seriously not going to want any summons at all. So keep that in mind before you go summoning something that could potentially waste a lot of time. Room 2 can be an absolute nightmare for people who don't understand its gimmick. Let me explain. There are four puppet masters in here, each with their own particular attacks, which more or less are harmless. The gimmick though is you must kill the puppets one at a time. By that I mean every time you hit a puppet master, it will massively heal all of the other puppets that are currently alive. This effectively means that while you are attempting to kill one puppet, you cannot be hitting the other ones as well. The party must coordinate and make sure that we're on the same page here. Now you must know the mob aggro patterns of the puppet masters and it will always work like this. All four puppet masters will always focus one character in particular and it is determined even before you enter into the room. Female mages and gunners are always the first initial choice for the puppets. If there are none in your party, it will always go after the leftmost party member in the first party slot. If you're unsure, just wait and see who the puppet masters are focusing and get away from them. Once you determine who the puppet masters are focusing, this separation job becomes a whole lot easier. If you're the focus of attack, try to aggro all of the puppet masters to the left side of the room, whereas the rest of the party drag one and only one puppet master to the right side and kill him hard and fast. Let me also inform you that it is general practice that the party always go after the blue puppet master first. The reason for this is he casts a spell that warps all players to his location. This can obviously cause problems when the idea is not to group yourselves or the enemies together. Other than that, after you've dispatched the blue puppet master, you can just grab another one and slowly start dispatching them one at a time. Again, as I've already mentioned, aside from the blue one, all the other attacks and skills are pretty much harmless. Warning: Do not use 
any cubes in this room. We'll explain why in a sec, but just trust me on this. This is personally one of my least favorite rooms in all of the otherverse, but quite easy to explain. There are three golden dragons that can be seen spawning in. It's your job to kill them to clear the room. Easy as that, right? <laughs> you wish. See, they make things so much more difficult when soon after they disguise themselves into brown dragons and then summon like 15 other identical dragons to confuse you. Where the fuck did they go? It is now your job to find the real ones and kill them, all without killing any of the other decoys. If you accidentally kill a decoy dragon, the party is punished by a devastating one-shot attack that will wipe everyone. So I guess you're wondering, how can you tell which one is the real one? Well, the only way is to check out their icon in the HP bar. Pretty clever, actually. The gold dragon still has his gold mug showing right there. The strategy then is to find one, then try to isolate him so that the party can use some hyper skills without focusing everyone else. It's harder than it sounds with this many mobs on screen. Isolation might be made easier with items like the Sky Tree Nut, which is why I suggested in bringing them. You can even do a trick as I show here to knock back all of the decoys early on, giving your party a chance to corral all three golden dragons without dispersing them too much. The most important thing in this room though, don't use cube skills. In reaction to a cube skill being used, the dragons will perform a reshuffle, basically meaning that all the dragons positions will be randomized again. Don't do it unless you truly can't find one. Now if you manage to kill a gold dragon, the screen will briefly turn black, displaying the location of the remaining gold dragons. If you're quick, you can even kill them during this time, as they are the only mobs shown on the screen. Each dragon has a chance to drop a chronicle gear or recipe, but it's not guaranteed. You could walk out of this room with three or zero chronicle gears. What is up with this place in three dragons, huh? This is technically a mini boss fight, and the rules are simple. You have to kill all three dragons, that's it. The gimmick, however, is that they must be killed at relatively the same time. Once a dragon is killed, you have 10 seconds or so to kill the others to avoid it being respawned again. There are indeed cube reactions from the bosses, but I won't go so far as to say not to use them. There are, however, some things you should know about their patterns. Unlike most mobs in this dungeon, these guys can do some serious damage to you. The blue one is said to be the strongest, who spits orbs at you for massive damage. The red one in particular might be the most annoying. Aside from the fact that he's strong and can cast large flame showers, he also consistently jumps to the opposite side of the room, and the white one can actually jump towards the middle of the room. All in all, this just means that it makes it difficult to group these guys together, effectively making it a challenge to corral all of the enemies and burst them all in one shot. Aside from a little coordination needed from the party, I don't have much else to remind you. I have done some testing on my own and have found that if a dragon is resummoned, he will have less HP than when he had initially, in essence making them really easy to kill even if you do screw up and they are able to resummon. Warning, again, do not use any cube skills in this room, as will be explained pretty shortly. Now Magnius isn't really a pushover, but if handled right, he can be dispatched quickly. Let's talk about his primary attacks. The most notable attack Magnius has, aside from various spear stabs and such, is a gimmick in itself. The players will be divided into two spheres, blue and red. Your particular color is predetermined and is dependent only on your position in the party. Players 1 and 3 will be blue, whereas players 2 and 4 will be red. Keep that in mind, as this player is now your partner. The gimmick is started when you see these orbs placed on your character. You must be somewhere near your party member of the same color. If at any point in time you walk away from your partner of the same color, or walk towards a member that is of the opposite color, you will take consistent damage over time. Aside from that though, as long as you're near your party member and staying away from the others, you can still fight the good fight as if nothing were wrong. This is adult, however, when the boss casts his other skill, Mind Control. This will basically force your character to perform actions randomly. In this case, it's going to force you to either run or walk aimlessly all over the place. Obviously, if this is the case, it is nigh impossible to control the orb gimmick, and so this is where the brainwash potion comes into play. Use them whenever you seem to lose control of your character. I suppose I will warn you guys that the damage from the orbs is not all that significant, however the duration of the mind control is significant enough to waste a lot of time if you have to wait for everybody to recover. Other than that, the boss reacts negatively to cube skills by spawning a clone of himself. 
Now the clone itself is not that troublesome, as it doesn't really do much damage or anything, but it does have a decent amount of HP and confuses as to which one is the real one, overall just wasting a lot of time killing things you don't need to kill. He's also invincible during the casting of this skill, which is also losing precious time for you just to get hit with more gimmicks and mind controls. A really good strategy in killing this guy is keeping him juggled so that he's not able to cast any of his skills. The final boss has got to be the most convoluted and crazy boss fight in all of the other bursts. This is because he has tons of minions and room damaging attacks. That being said, he is also one of the most straightforward ones too. Basilisk, in accordance to his name, will periodically use stone type moves and petrify party members randomly. The idea in fighting this guy is to try and stand behind him and hit stun him to oblivion with pretty much everything you have Die, consistently Die. non-stop. In fact, if you do that well, you can skip a lot of his gimmick phases outright, and you can actually kill him before he gets any of his strong attacks off, but we'll still talk about the two big ones here. At certain points of HP, he will cast an attack that summons these lizard statues. I suggest someone take the time away from pummeling the boss senseless to actually breaking these. Not only will Basilis continue to spam a room-wide attack, but after a time they will summon a dragon which will prove more challenging than normal to dispatch afterwards. The ultimate attack, however, is what you need to look out for, and occurs when he is relatively close to dying. He will open a dimensional gate that will almost never miss. I've only seen the dodge this attack once and I don't even know how. He will warp all party members to the leftmost part of the room and petrify them. This time though, the petrification will last a seriously long time. I believe it might be upwards of 40 seconds long. As mentioned, this is where you're going to need to use your petrification potion to become useful again. You seriously don't want to be that guy who's stuck in the corner looking like he's AFK for the whole time. During this attack, the boss will set up a sort of minefield barrage of stone pillars, an attack that will not stop until at least one party member makes it to him on the rightmost part of the map and damages him. Then you can just keep pummeling him as usual. Unlike most boss battles, this one ends before you get him to zero bars, as he has a small endearing monologue about how humans should rule the world with how much curb stomping they do. Whatever. Then he dies. Ha! Get wrecked, non-human. But anyway guys, that's it. Thanks for watching. We've taken a bit of time to cover one of the most gimmicky Otherverse dungeons. In the next video, we will alter our attention to one of the easiest, Rangelis' Gorillas, one of the most straightforward Otherverse dungeons there is. Catch you guys then.